Hello, my health freedom loving friends. Misty Carlfeld here with Health Freedom Idaho. I'm happy to say that I'm here with Thea Harn and her husband, Devlin, and we're going to give you an update on uh, Bring Daniel Home. Um, there's some good news and some hard news, so buckle up and enjoy the ride. Here we go. Well, let's start with a little bit of good news, Thea. We were just interacting a little bit, and I can see that you're recovering from the stroke. For those of you who don't know, you'll need to watch the previous video that we did talking about the case with Daniel. Mom suffered a stroke, um, and it sounds like it's because of the stress, so I'll have her fill us in on that, uh, of, of, um, of Daniel being, you know, really not given back to her by Idaho CPS. And... Um, it was hard. It was a hard conversation. An hour and a half you pushed through last time. And now I can tell you're sounding so much better. Tell us about your your recovery. And was it has it been actually classified as like a heartbreak stroke? That's what I'm hearing from our mutual friend. Um, the doctor said that it was pretty much a trauma-induced stroke. Um, a mild, I want to say a TIA. And that it needs to get under control so he told me to do physical therapy occupational therapy um i'm not walking with the cane which is good i have it if i need it and my husband helps me if needed um but i'm doing better and i'm sounding better and my speech is better and he said that you know, as the weeks go on, it will progress to stay on my uh, exercising, which I'm swimming all the time. He pushes me really hard and uh, more walking. So it's working. Oh, you're doing such an incredible job. And it's not easy. I can't imagine trying to focus on recovery and also getting your son back. And you're also in another state. It's got to be overwhelming. So good for you. Yeah, it is. It's been difficult, but I did get a phone call this week and I did get a Zoom call yesterday with Daniel. And I think that's kind of helped me and pushed me. Um, so to see his face for the first time in what, nine months, almost 10 months, it has really made me take it to the next level. Yes. Yes. I love that. Okay. So Devlin, tell us a little bit about yourself. We heard um, what amazing man you are driving your wife because she's got um, arthritis, very terribly painful arthritis. And my own condition is polyarteritis nodosa. So it's sort of in the arthritis family. So I can understand that crippling pain and how difficult it would be to drive and uh, get here, you know, immediately from Arizona to come and get Daniel, especially when you guys were on your way to California. Um, but it sounds like you're the kind of husband that generously and lovingly and kindly drives Thea to her appointments and to the places that she needs to go. What a blessing you are. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, uh, what all you want to know. Um, uh, yeah, I just help her wherever I can help. Uh, driving her to appointments or the grocery store, wherever wherever we go, I'm always driving. Um, but yeah, just the um, help her wherever she needs help, you know, with getting her out to swim with the therapy and helping her on um, around the place if she needs help walking or if um, she's not having a good day, um, just try and uplift her and help her with whatever she needs. Um, and it sounds like you're a natural caregiver because you were taking care of your mom as well, right? Yeah, I helped take care of my mom for over 20, probably almost 30 plus years helping with my mom because she was um, she was hit by a drunk driver when I was 13. And so she was total care and our family took care of her at home. So she was a quadriplegic and um, she was bedridden. And so um, from 13 on, she was always someone had to be with her and take care of her. And um, she was fed through a, a, a tube in her stomach and, you know, with um, complete uh, or something like insure complete. And um, she couldn't speak. She could only answer yes or no questions. And um, so I've 
been around it long enough to know and, and also helped take my grandparents for while they were in their old age for 10 plus years. So oh, that's amazing. So <laughs> tell me what it was like to take care of Daniel when he was home. Obviously, he was home and in your care and things were going well. And then he went to stay with dad for a little while while Thea was getting um, some diagnosis or some treatment for things that were going on with her. And so how were, how did things go when Daniel was at home? It was pretty good. Um, he'd go with us wherever we'd go if we were traveling. Um, we'd take him places where we're traveling or if um, we were, you know, up to the pool, he'd go up the pool or if we were, um, you know, if it was just at home time, you know, around the place, we had farm animals and, and he'd go out and deal with the farm animals and feed the farm animals or he'd be out uh, metal detecting. Yeah. <laughs> um, he loved to metal detect and dig up things and try and find stuff in the ground around our place that we had before. And then, um, um, I mean, school wise, he'd do his school work and color and learn and do different things that he was, um, doing. And yeah, there's pictures of, of him with his animals and, um, can hardly see the other one. Mother's Day. Uh, that was, Day, yeah. yeah, me and Daniel on Mother's Day. So cute. Yeah. That was actually my daughter's graduation on the right. Okay. Um, he went out to dinner after she had graduated, and that's my daughter who um, I homeschooled for a little while, and she's going to college in North Carolina. And that's Daniel at the beach. He loves to go body surfing when we visit my mom in California. And oh, that, yeah. I love it. I love it. And speaking of your daughter, if I understand right, she's kind of delayed as far as um, she has a delay, like a, a, a thought process delay. Is that what I would say? Um, I would probably call it that. She um, had a little bit of delay when she was in her teens. Um, and like I said, she's now attending college in North Carolina, but I also have another daughter who is a little delayed and she's in Houston. Um, she's going to start going to community college and my oh. older daughter, I homeschooled her, um, eight through 12th grade. She graduated with a homeschool group, all that stuff. She's actually in school becoming a, a licensed social worker. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, well, that's that's incredible. And I think all of that speaks to the fact that you're more than capable of and have been capable of taking care of Daniel, um, even with the new um, stroke brought on to, by this whole this whole event. Uh, and, and I'm going to share a little bit that I haven't really shared with folks that I, I'm hoping will give them a new perspective because people know me and they know how my passion for my children and that's why I do what I do. But, and they know that I have an autoimmune disease and I was bedridden for, for a time, but I haven't really talked about the fear or concern of um, the state interfering because a family is going through a hard time. I was even a single mom. You know, I didn't have the aid of a wonderful husband that it seems that you have. And um, it, I was, you know, bedridden for quite some time. And it was, it was hard. But I can tell you right now, if they had taken any one of my four children or all four of my children, I would have just died out of despair. You know, it was their laughter and their love that made me fight every day. Right. And it wasn't up for the state to decide how I would care for my children during that time. I was, I was capable of directing their care, meaning um, our church and my children's um, teachers, they organized a food train for me and um, they brought meals every day for several months. I couldn't even go to the grocery store. The hard, cold floor of the grocery store was crippling for my nerves. Um, I would wear Ugg boots all the time if I had to stand. And I put heaters in there because those little heater things, um, because the cold was so excruciatingly painful. 
So I had family and friends and employees and uh, um, people from the church and from the school helping me with all of those things. It was sort of like a who's on first, who's on second. And there was a few months that it was that it was like that. And then I had to go to the Mayo Clinic, much like you had to go for some treatment and diagnosis. I had to figure out what the heck was wrong with me. I was gone for two weeks and um, received really intense testing. And, uh, you know, my ex-mother-in-law came to my house and took care of my kids while I was gone and she ran their care. And then I came home and, um, you know, tried my best to resume. And then I got a diagnosis of uh, polyarteritis nodosa and they told me I needed to do three years of chemotherapy and I had seven to 10 years to live. Um, I didn't uh, do the chemotherapy and I didn't receive their expiration date. And because I had um, four amazing, beautiful, loving kids that were praying for me and loving me, you know, I felt like I fought like a warrior from heaven, you know, for my right. kids. And, um, and if the state had interfered anywhere along the way, rather than my loving community, it would have, it would have been devastating to my recovery and to my family. And I want to add something else for anybody who might be listening. Um, families go through hardships. That's part of the learning. That's part of the growing. Um, it helps grow compassion for people. You know, my children had a very strong independent mother before I was crippled by pain. And they got to see me be humbled and have to receive. They got to see how important it was to have somebody bring you a meal that day. You know, that it meant everything. It meant their mom didn't have to try to push through the pain to make it happen. They got to see their own teachers who taught at a Christian school put their words, put their actions where their mouth was and actually do the benevolence that they taught the children to do. These life lessons are so valuable for our children. And this, if the state had interfered, they would have lost all those valuable lessons of compassion and would have had the devastation of being ripped apart from their, from their ill mother. Right. So for anybody who's to say, well, it is a blessing for the state to intervene if you're sick. It is not. And it is not up for the state to determine how a family copes with a devastating illness. And, and I'm living proof of the fact that you can get better outside of farmers, pharma's expiration date on your life. Because I'm at eight years, and they said seven to 10 years, and the bonus three years was if I were to do the chemotherapy. And I'm no longer bedridden, and I'm getting my life back, and it's beautiful because I love Jesus, and I worked hard to heal, heal my own body outside of pharma and outside of the government. Amen. I and People will open I, their minds to understand that because you're going, your family's going through a, a hardship and you have some, some uh, medical issues some health issues, that does not mean anybody, the state or otherwise, should determine to take your children. No, uh, and I so agree. And I've been very quiet. My close, I have a very small circle and my close friends, they know the struggles in my health that I've had for the last 20 years. This is not something new right. because I have seen medical experts all over the country. And first it was, you know, maybe Gulf War syndrome. And then they said, no, it might be fibromyalgia. And it just kept getting worse and worse. And I was open to every single opportunity that they had um, for medication, but I had always gone alternative. We have always chosen the alternative route until I was diagnosed with this rheumatoid arthritis, which is difficult for me to drive long distance. I can drive. I have a driver's license. But when I sit in a vehicle for beyond four or five hours, it takes me all day and night to recover, to even walk sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it's very 
non-conducive for me to take pain medication rather than to avoid doing what I know is going to cause me pain. So I take it as needed. He won't let me lay around in bed all day and feel sorry for myself. He will say, let's go for a walk. Let's take the dog to the dog park. Let's get moving. Let's get to the pool. Um, Hey, you need your cane. (laughs) I'm like, maybe not today. I'll use the shopping cart. Um, You know, I'm independent. It's not like I'm in bed all day, bedridden, and I can't do anything for myself. I could go to the bathroom on my own. And my doctor is very pleased with my progress so far. Um, Like I said, it's the P's and the S's that um, (laughs) it's a little bit of few things here and there, but I'm getting back, I would say, about 75% back to speed. And I wholeheartedly agree with you, Misty, that I don't feel that the state should step in and say, well, because of this, you can't take care of your child. Or, you know, even when I was a single mom with three children before I met my husband, which he's absolutely amazing. We've been together almost five years and I wouldn't have been able to even accomplish what I have in the last four years without him. Mm -hmm. So he's been very instrumental in helping me with Daniel and he's been very amazing to get us outdoors more and being involved in the community and taking care of ourselves better. This guy won't even drink caffeine. He won't drink any soda. He's, you know, really opposed to any medicine that could potentially harm our bodies. And I do have a liver condition that I have to be very super careful with any type of medicines. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you wholeheartedly, and your journey has brought us at, at an intersection to me, and I'm so thankful for those types of relationships being formed and partnerships and communities growing with that compassion. You know, I honestly, wholeheartedly, had no idea what role CPS plays in our life or you know, people call them because they're desperate for help at times. And then it's like, whoa, they're not there to help at all. Right. It's even beyond my comprehension and thought process. Why do they even tear families apart like this? Well, it's because of the funding through ASFA. You know, and until that's changed, I know there's some good bills out there. I just saw something on a federal level, you know, sort of wanting to get um, CPS caseworkers to to respect rights of parents, um, which is which is great. You know, I agree with that, but it's never going to end until we end the funding that happens through ASFA to take children and rehome them to other families. I mean, the state gets four thousand dollars of our Social Security money when they take a child from one family and rehome them to another one. It's supposed to be, you know, America's Safe Family Adoption Act. You know, it's like, oh, let's let let's make it safe to rehome children. I mean, it sounds so nice and fluffy, but the fact of the matter is it incentivizes states to take children and rehome them. And then you have the funding that happens when a child like yours, who's autistic, right, autistic, um, needs extra care. That means the state gets more funding for extra care. So, um, you know, it's it's a tragedy when people reach out to them in good faith, thinking that they're going to receive the help that they desperately need. And that's why I'm such a huge advocate for communities to help families, not government. Your church, your family, friends, like you've created in your circle, I created in my circle. And, you know, I was far beyond blessed and my children were blessed because we reached out to the community and not the government. So many people told me you should sign up for disability or you should do this or that. And I was like, I don't want anybody in my home except for my loved ones. And I, at that point did not understand um, CPS or what they would do. I just was naturally drawn to just my own people because I'm pretty private. It may not seem like it since I do these videos, 
that I'm actually pretty private, which is why it's a little bit hard to share my own personal story. Um, but I wanted to, to help people understand your situation. I was hoping if I shared mine, it would help. So let's, let's catch up a little bit on, on, on Daniel, a, little, a, a brief overview. And that is that um, you were receiving that care uh, and Daniel went to stay with his father for a while. Both father and Daniel had expressed wanting to have some time together. So you thought, well, this is going to be perfect timing. Father cut off uh, communication with you. Um, and then you were concerned about where is Daniel? Your own mother was concerned about where is Daniel? And she reached out to CPS um, in, because of that thought process that they were on your side and wanting to keep families together. And, and, um, and so they were supposed to help you find Daniel. Daniel was found in a library by himself. Dad and stepmom have been homeless and going uh, to different shelters or hotels or whatever they could muster and um, not giving Daniel the education or treatment or care that he needs. In fact, I recently found out from you that stepmom had called the police like seven times on Daniel's outburst because as you explained before, if Daniel's space and um, his bubble isn't respected, like a lot of children with autism, he freaks out, he gets upset, he lashes out. And where you and your husband have been able to work within that and help him, his dad and his stepmom don't quite have the same toolkit or will even utilize the toolkit to work with Daniel. Is that sum it up pretty well? Yeah, pretty much. And like the communication was very sporadic. It was email only. Uh, Daniel wasn't calling me regularly. And then he had stopped all communication pretty much when I kept asking for Daniel a visit. Um, and it's, I don't think they had the capacity to understand what Daniel is challenged with. And when you have cared for somebody like I have and, and my husband has, you have that level of compassion for people. And I honestly don't think that they were capable. They didn't have him in therapy. They didn't have him on his medication. And it's difficult when you don't have that community right. or you don't have a therapist for your child. I mean, we took him consistently to therapy. We took him to family therapy, family therapy for us on how to handle that better Daniel's behaviors right. and I mean we went above and beyond to get him what he needed and connected in nature and sports and church and all these things that helped him um, but therapy was the best thing for Daniel this since he was five and because it was his way to express himself to another third party right. and we would all work together um you know when dad and i both lived in idaho daniel did go to therapy dad did get involved um and then unfortunately he damaged those relationships with some therapist and i had to go find another therapy for daniel and we had to start the process all over again yeah. And then dad moved and came back a couple of times and there was just no consistency. Right. So when I felt like Daniel came back after summer and he really, really wanted to live with his dad, we had talked about this for years. And since dad was out of Idaho, I figured now would be the time to send Daniel, get these problems resolved. And then Daniel would come back after our temporary agreement. And the state knows that I have primary custody of Daniel. And I couldn't find dad to serve him modification or emergency orders. Right. And what blew my mind is seven different agencies knew where dad was, but wouldn't tell me where he was. Wow. The police. Nampa police, the Canyon County sheriffs, uh, the school that Daniel was enrolled in that 
CPS, I believe, got involved and forced him to enroll him in school. The school wouldn't tell me. Their policy was not to tell me what his address was. And so I did hire a private investigator to find them. And they couldn't find him because he was living at hotels. There was no address permanently for him. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so... Um, essentially what happened is they found him and they gave you how long to show up and, and get Daniel. This is Idaho CPS. They went to the library to talk to Daniel and they took the Nampa police and the workers overheard the policemen talk and to Daniel. And then they all talked about what they were going to do. They removed him immediately. Then they called me and told me they removed him. And then by the time that the CPS worker called me back, because I called her all day long, like four or five times, I didn't get a call until that night that court was the next morning. So it was like, can you get to Idaho? Where are you? And I'm like, I'm not anywhere near Idaho. I can't be there by court in the morning. And then that's why I asked for an extension on the Friday and it continued to Monday and Tuesday hearing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so essentially because you couldn't get here, it was like, well, now you've just given up rights and now we have them in our care. Is that how it went? Yeah, pretty much. I told her that, you know, I'm living in my travel trailer. There's some medical issues that I have and I fear for my safety from my ex and some of the people that he's involved in. And I was very forthright and very honest and my words got twisted. Yeah, they always do. They always do. And you even offered to pay for Daniel's flight directly to you, but they wouldn't do that. No, they said they were unable to return him to me. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I think that gives everybody the overview. If you want more detail, you can go to Health Freedom Idaho's YouTube channel and watch the one that we've done previous to this. So let's move forward and talk about um, where you're at now. You have the GoFundMe. It looks like you've raised, last I looked, it was like maybe almost eight or $900. Correct. We're very close um, to getting what we need to secure a private attorney. Um, because the public defender is, I just don't feel very confident about the situation and learning more about what I've learned from so many amazing resources on how this process works legally. Um, I got an email today that, no, he's not going to come back on the fourth with me. Even if I went there, the judge still has to make a determination. But I got another email this morning saying that, that, and this is what blows my mind, is that I asked Daniel on the video, hey son, are you on your medicine? Are you sleeping good? No medicine, mom. And that was one of the reasons why they removed him from his dad's care. So then I got an email saying that they were doing assessments on Daniel to figure out what he needs. This young man, now 14, has been through so many assessments that I cannot begin to tell you that this has caused so much anguish for me just knowing he's been assessed since the age of almost four and a half five right right i mean it would be you think it would be simple for them to reach out to you and be like okay what is his care plan and then keep him on his care plan because you've already done it you've already done all the research and it was working well but no it doesn't make the money to do it that way so they have to start all over from the beginning and the person who su who suffers is the patient you know, right. if, if I had to start all over and have somebody reassess me all these years of trying to figure things out, it would be devastating and exhausting. And it would wreck everything that I've done up until now. I know you can understand that. And I can understand that on um, Daniel's behalf. So it isn't right. And to add to that, every 
every case that I've gotten involved with where I've helped the parents speak out, the child has always done worse in state care. Always. Every single time. If it was a gaining weight issue, they lost weight in care. For example, and now here's Daniel not getting the care that he needs, even though the state intervenes and says, well, you're not giving the care, then the state intervenes and then they don't give the care or they give worse care or they put them through this whole, you know, rigmarole of starting the process over. And that is not kind, just that's not good care. And it certainly isn't the care that Thea has already been proven to give her son. And Absolutely. You're not even in, in Idaho. Why is it, I, you know, it, it makes me crazy. Idaho it, should be giving you back your son and that's it. And then Arizona could deal with whatever they thought was an issue, but you don't have an issue in Arizona. <laughs> and the problem lays in is that one, I should have never been a party to this case. No. And I'm not there. And they should have returned him to right. me and made accommodations because of right. the situation. That's and the state, the state is well aware of the situation. CPS right. is well aware of the situation. And there was, um, you know, amicable discussions of I could get him. My mom can get him. My husband can get him. I have a family friend that can get him. Um, in their custody and, you know, we'll get him back to me. But, you know, it seems like they don't want to cooperate because of that funding, right. because of that process. Um, they know exactly what the problem is and they won't release him. And, and we're living in a time where we're always talking about making accommodations. I run, a, I own a property management company and we're always talking about making accommodations for people for their living situation. So we can't make accommodations for returning a, a son to his mother. That's insane to me. Um, and then let, you, you, as you brought up about your defender, your, <laughs> your, uh, your defense attorney who is in the kangaroo court system and people need to understand this person is never going to fight for the parent the way they should. Because why would they put themselves out of a job? It's counterintuitive. They're all paid by this funding of CPS. It's like any other private business. And that's what it is. It's a private business. And they're going to run it in a way that continues to make them a profit so that the defense attorneys can be paid. The prosecuting attorneys can be paid. The doctors can be paid, the judges can be paid, the rent can be paid, the caseworkers can be paid. All of these people are on the dole with our tax money and they're paid to rehome and take and rehome children. I'm not saying there aren't real children who are suffering. And right. real parents who are, they, those exist. But in my mm, experience, I would say, Unfortunately, and sadly, those are the parents that keep getting their children back and the children keep getting harmed and it's good families and that really love their children and well-loved children who are taken and uh, rehomed. That's, that's the sad, ugly, heartbreaking truth of our American CPS system. Yeah, and I'm learning that firsthand that this process just I never thought I would be involved in this type of process and it just blows my mind and it breaks my heart for yeah. people like Daniel yeah. because he has already been through so much yeah. and you know, as a mother, we love our kids. We would lay down and die for our kids and you know, some people have lost their mom so young, like my husband. He didn't have a mother, but he's always so careful around kids. And he just had a grandbaby that he's not been able to see because he's dealing with my health issues and making sure that I'm healthy, that I can get to a point where we can both travel to go back to Idaho and see his grandbaby. And I mean, he has such a compassion for people and I just can't fathom Daniel living with another family no. and then 
not being able to talk to him or see his face no. and then not being able to have any contact with him no. as he becomes a young man. Of course, of course. We, as parents, every parent can relate to the fact that we have hopes and dreams for our children and things we want to do, plans that we're making, th things we want to explore, things we want to teach them, you know. Um, and I, I, can, I can fully understand, friend. So all of that being said. You know, Daniel loves to cook, and he cooks healthy meals, and Dev's taught him, you know, uh, chicken homemade chicken noodle soup when we don't feel well and um, <laughs> things like that and he wants to be a chef and we're talking about a child that i've made arrangements to make sure that he has the support if something happened to me his sisters have loved him and have cared for him and because they are older they you know, took autism classes with me on how to better handle him. We have done our homework and right. we have done amazing things for him and giving him experiences that, you know, the average kid probably would have never had. That's and right. with children with special needs, you make accommodations, yes. you change your plans on the spot, you do things that they want you to do and you enjoy them even better. So I can't imagine not being able to hug him or tell him I love him. Yeah. And you know, the reason I'm speaking out is for him and no one else. That's my love that I have for my son. Yeah, it's hard to be this vulnerable um, <laughs> in public. It's, it's, it's not yeah. easy, especially when you know the public is is going to be critical and harsh and uh they they oftentimes just as i did think it's the parents fault and looking for some reason you know and it, it, i think part of it has to do because it's just so darn hard to believe and wrap our heads around that the system could be this corrupt and that we're funding it and it's happening every day all around us and that it could be ourselves at some point uh, that's a really hard pill to swallow. It's a really hard truth to face. And not everybody's capable of doing it, I've found. Well, you know, the day after the shelter hearing that morning, I had woken up and I knew I didn't feel well. And then I had the stroke that morning. But I did feel guilty. I did feel like it was my fault this happened. And then I had to really understand that my fault was perhaps loving my son enough to send him to his dad's where his dad was not capable. I learned the hard way. He's just not capable to care for him. Right. Right. It's hard. It's hard friend, but you know, all of that being said, this is the reason why you need a private attorney and not one that's on the government dole and uh, in the whole CPS kangaroo court system. You, you can't win that way. And um, you need a couple thousand more in order to secure a private attorney. And where, whereas you're, you can't be here right now and you're making arrangements to be here, it sounds like, you do need an attorney to represent you there in court, right? Absolutely. And I have nothing bad to say about this public defender. But like you said, they're not... Their goal is to, they're not going to bite the hand that feeds them. Okay. They're not. And they're not fighting for your best interest. And it breaks my heart because Daniel gets an attorney that's also funded from that same organization. Right. Right. It's, I mean, it's just, it's a racket. It, there's no other way to, to describe it. It's a racket. Um, so you're you're making arrangements to be here, right? You're getting ready to relocate here, and you've got a program that he's enrolled in. Tell us about that. Um, actually, I wasn't going to relocate back to Idaho. Um, I reached out to some resources right where I am that can help. Okay. Um, I have an autism center here. 
Um, oh, they yeah, also, maybe, um, maybe I misunderstood or maybe our friend misunderstood, but anyway, I was just on a phone call and he said, I think she's making plans to relocate here and get him in a, and get him in a program, but that's there. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, I, um, in the process of filing my intent to homeschool Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, because we do live in an area where, um, there is no special services for him. And then working through um, either two different programs I have options for. They do have an online school for autistic children. And then the other option is what I used for my daughter, and that was Abeka. So they have an online homeschool program, which yeah. is absolutely amazing. Oh, yeah, Abeka's great. I actually had <laughs> taught in my previous life, it seemed like. I taught uh, first and second grade homeschool at my church and we used a Becca and yeah. it was actually how I realized and learned that in my government funded school, I didn't learn as I, should, I didn't learn the truth of our history or our science or anything like God was completely removed from everything that you learn in government school and government yeah. school will never teach you how to stand up to the government. <laughs> so right. there's a little oh, bit yeah. in your pocket. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, like I said, I'm not here to hurt anybody. I'm not here to disparage anyone. I just want Daniel home. You want your son back. Like so yeah. many other parents who are in, trapped in this system. And sometimes I start, um, you know, somebody will come to me and they're so far gone in the system that I'm like, I... I mean, I believe in miracles and it's, you know, it's really time to get on your knees and ask God for a miracle because you're so far deep into the system. But you didn't do that. You said no from the get go. I'm not signing your stuff. I'm not getting wrapped into your system. I want my son back. There's no reason you should keep him. And you stood up for your rights just sort of naturally without really being educated about the whole thing. But you really inherently knew and you stood up for your rights. And I think that gives you the best advantage going forward. And now that you're talking to Robert and you're talking to Christine and you've got these people that are helping you um, and, and will advocate for you, I think you have a pretty good chance of getting Daniel back. And I hope and pray for your sake and for his sake and your daughter's sake. It's your, it's, this is your family unit. It's your, it's your family unit and the state should not interfere. And that's, that is, that's the fun, a fundamental fact that I think um, over time we've, we've forgotten Absolutely. And you, you said something earlier that really resonated with me about um, when you were going through your illness, that you had resources. We have resources. Right. Everybody has resources. If you start to look around, there's more community than you believe right yeah. now in this day and age. Yes. And I'm learning that as I share this story you will be judged like no tomorrow but you know your fundamental right is to stand up and say this is not acceptable right this is not right so mm -hmm. we have people in place that you've mentioned that have shown me some things i didn't see before and i'm blown away at this whole organization that is intrusive and the more research I've done the less shocked I am because there is funding to put licensed social workers in libraries and they've been doing it for the last couple of years in COVID and knowing that there's homeless there are kids that are unattended and I feel like they're just waiting for the next kid to target and take. I had no idea. I had no idea of what you're saying right now. They're yeah. paying licensed social workers to hang out in libraries and essentially bust parents for being homeless or, or not being there with their children. Yeah. Libraries are funding to hire licensed social workers to work in libraries full time. Absolutely. You know, that's so interesting because I, I do look at um, whenever whenever I'm asked to speak in a different state, you know, which I've done in Utah. And so I looked at their numbers, um, 
in, in comparison to Idaho's numbers. And it is interesting in Utah, um, they tend to call CPS more often on their own families. And I think it's because of what you're saying, where they think that it can be helpful. And then um, in Idaho, schools more often call on families. And so in the middle of the you know COVID pandemic, um, schools weren't reporting because children weren't in schools. So then they have to make up those numbers somewhere because they have to pay their bills. So you see in 2020 and 2021, um, more children are taken because of homelessness um, and less for neglect and things that would be reported from schools. So, I mean, those numbers are there and show us that they have to try to keep those numbers somewhere. And so I bet you anything, they discovered that homeless people go to libraries and this was a good uh, income stream. And so now they're like, well, now we can do both. You know, we can we can take um, homeless people's children and um, we can uh, take children from who are being reported, you know, the families are being reported from schools. And I don't have the slides in front of me. If people want to see my slides, they can go to Health of Idaho's YouTube channel and you can see the funding I'm talking about, how many children they lose, lose, how do you right. lose children, um, how it's feeding the um, human trafficking. Uh, you, you, can, you can see all of that. You have to kind of see those numbers to really believe what I'm saying here. So I hope you, I hope you go and, and watch that. Um, it's, it's tragic. It's absolutely tragic. But I believe Thea, kind of like with Christine, I believe they've poked the wrong mama bear. And once you get Daniel back, I don't think we've heard the last of you. I think you'll be working to help other people. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that I was passionate about is helping other people. My background in natural health and just community I feel that at one time I wanted to run for some type of office, but I really believe that we need a lot of reform in our country and it starts with our children. And what I've seen in the last three weeks, I am so disheartened, but it has fired up something in me with a passion that this is an issue. This is something massive that's happening across the country. I saw a lady in California right now that was targeted to have her child taken away. And she is on a mission yeah. to stop the madness, to stop this intrusion into our family situations. I mean, this was somebody who was disgruntled with her and yeah. got back in retaliatory by yeah. calling CPS. Yeah. And then in another case, a family member called and, you know, it because they wanted their granddaughter and yeah. the daughter cut off all ties with the grandparents. So the grandparents called and made a report and it just made it worse. Yeah. And now they've taken the child away from the mother and the grandmother. And yeah. I feel that that's what's happening here. Idaho has no intention to return Daniel. And I'm not going to sit down and be quiet like thousands of other parents that have just went away. Yeah. With their not heart. Everybody, and their yeah. yeah. Not everybody has the fight. You know, I found they just not everybody has the fight. Um, but I see that you do. And um, I hope people donate. We'll put the link, you know, we'll attach it to the video. Please donate, friends, whether it's $10, $50, $1,000, it all adds up and we'll help Thea get an attorney and get her beloved Daniel home. Um, please pray. Please pray for this family. Please pray for our nation. Yes. Uh, state. We do need great reform. And I see, I see people trying and they're bringing bills that they're hoping that it's really just going to be a speed bump because the monster will figure out how to feed itself. You know, it'll just morph and change in order to keep, you know, making that money as long as ASFA exists. So um, if we could, you know, really dedicate our prayers because our children are the future. I know that 
is yeah. cheesy because of the Whitney Houston song, but children are our future and they're the future of our state and our, our communities, even just our local communities. Our children will be the ones running those communities someday and the state and the country. And right. if we invest into our most precious commodity of our children and save them, then we're all going to be in trouble. Absolutely. And I, I would urge parents to know their rights. Yeah. I am technically still waiting from my attorney for my rights. I don't know what my rights are. So I've made a point this afternoon, as soon as we're done, to go and figure out what my rights are, because no one has told me to this day what my rights are. No, and you don't have any charges. Let's be clear. There are no charges against you. No, none. None, and they won't return Daniel. And your attorney, your court appointed on the government dole kangaroo court attorney has told you to be quiet, correct? They highly suggested that I took down the video that we did the first one. And why do you think that that is? Um, my guess would be they don't want me talking about what's happened. And they hoped I would go away. Yeah. They don't like the light being shined oh. in the dark thing they're doing. Go ahead. She was saying. They don't like the publicity it puts on them. They don't. Because what do you think will happen if, if people understand what's really taking place? Then that starts to crumble. They get worried that one voice could make a big impact and it does it totally does and so you have made the decision obviously because you're talking to me today to not be silenced right no and like i said i as a mom i would die for my child and do what it takes to make sure that they're safe and loved and cared for and that's the greatest calling that I've ever had <laughs> to be a, a good mom and a good wife and just a warrior for the Lord. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to reconsider your verbiage because I've had to reconsider my verbiage as well. Rather than dying for our children, you and I have worked really hard to live for our children. Live for our children. Yes, absolutely. And you and I have worked really hard it would have been easier to just die and go home and be with jesus in heaven that would have been easier hey uh, yeah we've both been there we've both been there and that would be and persevering is harder you're doing it every day i'm so you're absolutely right you're absolutely right and i will change that absolutely well, I'm incre incredibly honored to know you, and Devlin, it's wonderful to meet you. Is there anything that you would like to add, Devlin, and, and wrap up? I know being on the camera is not your favorite thing, but maybe there's something you'd like to share with folks. Um, not that I can think of right now. You know, off the top of my head. Okay. Oh, yeah, I have the last word. She's better at that. So. <laughs> yeah. He he is so kind and. I'm just thankful that I met him and, you know, we pray for our kids, our grandkids. We pray for our nation. Um, we really take our job seriously as parents and grandparents and people in the community to do the right thing. And I think what we have on our side is truth. truth. We just hope the truth comes out. Yeah. And all this. Yeah. Me too. Me too, friends. Well, I hope I get to meet you in person. We'll do an another update. What is the next hearing date? Um, they do pre-trial on Monday. And the adjudicatory hearing is on the 4th. Okay. On the 4th. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Uh, time's running out. But. Time's running out. So, you know, folks, donate, please, so she can get a, a, an attorney that's in it to win it in there. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Well, stand by. I'm going to sign off, and then um, you and I can chat for just a minute. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for joining. 
I hope you go online and donate, follow this story, hashtag bring Daniel home and, um, and say, say the prayers for this family because they're going to need some heavenly intervention. Um, goodbye for now, friends.